Hi everyone, I hope you're doing great today. Wow, so much has happened in the last few days from the last time that I updated us on the uh, Russia-Ukraine war. But as of this moment, the first thing you need to know is that the first shot in the war has been fired. And so basically, no matter where you were, no matter where you're looking from, the war has started in earnest, right? The second thing you need to know is that it's now evident, abundantly clear, that Ukraine is only being used as a bargaining chip or a pawn, P-A-W-N, by the world powers in this whole fracas. I can tell you that for sure. And the third thing is, no matter how much more diplomatic push they make, Example, the call between the Russian president and the French president yesterday. Um, I think that it has little to no chance of succeeding. But for me as a person, I believe that with God, all things are possible. Now, let me bring you up to speed on what has happened so far, just so you are not left out on anything. The first shot that was fired was in a place called Donetsk. Donetsk is the capital of the Donetsk People's Republic. And what is the Donetsk People's Republic? In the eastern part of Ukraine, there's a place called Donbass. Now, in Donbass, you have two breakaway quasi-republics. No country recognizes them, but they have autonomy. They rule themselves. They broke away from Ukraine and they have their own little government right there, just like Crimea, right? So in the Donbass region, you have this Donetsk People's Republic and you also have Luhansk People's Republic, all of them in the Donbass area. So it's almost like having two breakaway countries in just the eastern part of Ukraine alone that are pro-Russian, 100% loyal to Russia. There was a very pro-Russian president in Ukraine who came to power. And in 2014, the guy, Viktor Yanukovych, was kicked out of office. In fact, he was chased out of office by way of a massive protest, which Putin still blames the West for sponsoring up to today. So Putin has not forgiven the West for it. So because of that, these pro-Russian regions in Eastern Ukraine began to break away and say they want to rule themselves. And because Russia is far, far more powerful than Ukraine, Russia gave them their blessing and helped them to actually begin to rule themselves. So they have their own military formations. They have their police. They have their everything. I mean, they just function like countries, just the way Crimea is. Now, this Donetsk People's Republic, they have a military formation, like I said, and the military formation is called the, the People's Militia. They also have military vehicles. Now, it is one of those military vehicles that came under fire recently and was and exploded into pieces because there was a shelling that happened. You no, know, there was a bombing that took place and that vehicle was targeted. Nobody died, but the vehicle was blown into smithereens. There was also a kindergarten that was affected. There was a big hole that was dug through the, the wall of this kindergarten because of the bombing that happened. So shelling has been going on into that place, happening in that place. And when the leadership of this republic realized that this thing was beginning to get to civilian areas, they immediately announced an evacuation and started evacuating their people from that Donetsk region to the very next town, which is inside of Russia proper. I think it's called Rostov. So they began to move people over there. And as at this time, I think they said they've been able to evacuate at least 700,000 or a little over 700,000 people. Some of them are now in refugee camps inside of Russia, in football stadium in hotels, in makeshift tents and stuff like that. That's where many of them are right now as refugees and Russia is taking care of them, giving them stuff. Now, when this attack happened, okay, in Donetsk, I had always said this before from my previous videos, and I told you that 
because Russia does not have access to a lot of global media, they have only the RT, Russia Today. And I mean, how many people can RT reach out to? So if there's a true confirmed provocation coming in from inside of Ukraine to these pro-Russian areas, the world will not get to know that. No, nobody will know. Even if Russia has a confirmation that this came from Ukraine, nobody will know. Because as it is right now, what is happening is that Russia is blaming Ukraine and saying that Ukraine is attacking their people. They are Russia-speaking, pro-Russian people that now have a breakaway republic inside of that region. They say it is Ukraine that is attacking them because Ukraine is using this as a ploy, as a pretext to go in there and take back that place. And also, secondly, to provoke Russia to war. Now, if you talk about taking back, it would make a lot of sense. If you talk about provoking war, then you have to think twice about that. And that's the one that got the Western powers to get back at Russia and say, you're crazy. How can you have more than 130,000 soldiers around the Ukrainian border and you expect that Ukraine is going to want to provoke you to war? Do you see what is happening? And now, in, in reality, it doesn't make sense that Ukraine will go to provoke Russia to war. But the point is, is it Ukraine really that is going to be making that provocation? What if there are mercenaries inside of Ukraine? What if there are people who will do that on behalf of Ukraine, even without Ukraine knowing? You don't think there's a possibility for that, right? But with what I'm going to show you very soon, you realize that truly so much can happen on behalf of Ukraine without Ukraine being aware of it. And that is why I say that Ukraine is basically like a pawn. Okay, a PAWN in this game, or maybe Ukraine is being used as a bargaining chip by the world powers. That is so evident. And I'm going to show you something that will shock you to know that this is really true. So when that happened, the blame game began. Russia is blaming Ukraine. Ukraine is blaming Russia. Because already, remember way back when this whole thing started, Russia has been drumming that the West is going to do something and then provoke Russia and blame it on Russia and call it a false flag operation. And shortly after Russia had done that for like a whole week, we now started hearing in the global mainstream news media that Russia is going to stage a false flag operation. Russia started blaming them for that before. And then later, they now took over and started blaming Russia ahead of time. And this is like two, three weeks ago. That Russia is going to stage a false flag operation. And that will become like a pretext for Russia to jump in and invade Ukraine. When you say false flag, you do something and claim you didn't do it just so that it will give you the opportunity to go and carry out an action like an invasion of a country or something like that or start a war. That's the false flag operation. So they believe that this is that false flag operation that they've been predicting that Russia is going to stage. But Russia is saying, no, these guys who have been drumming the drums of war all along, even when they are the ones saying that they don't want war, they are the ones who are doing this because they want us to come to war. The Russia is saying, we don't want war. We've told the whole world that we don't want to invade Ukraine. Not today, not tomorrow, not next week, not even next month. We have shown them videos of, all of the withdrawal of our soldiers. And they say that we are lying. They say that, look, intelligence report is there to show that you are not withdrawing any soldiers. They say we have satellite images that you haven't actually withdrawn your soldiers and stuff like that. So Russia is saying we don't have any reason to go and do what they are blaming us of doing. They are the ones who won the war and they are the ones who are doing this. So the blame game is on. Nobody wants to take responsibility for what happened in Donetsk. And so while we were still dealing with the issue of explosions and bombing that took place in Donetsk region, another breakaway region in that eastern part of Ukraine also came under fire. And that one is the Luhansk People's Republic. So you can imagine shelling is taking place in Donetsk, shelling is taking place in Luhansk. How else can you understand that the war has started? What else do you want to see to know that the war has started? It has already started. It has started. In fact, an RT journalist who went to Donetsk to see what happened there actually narrowly escaped being shelled and they caught it on camera. 
So when all these breakaway regions are coming under fire, you can imagine the West now coming out to give press briefings to say, look, we told you this guy is going to stage a false flag operation. And that's how Biden came out and spoke on a world stage and told everybody that, look, I am convinced now that Putin is going to invade Ukraine. So it was no longer speculation this time around. He came out openly and said, I am now convinced. So now, for you to understand the implications of what he said, this man is the president of the greatest nation on earth. He has access to some of the finest and most credible intelligence information on earth. So when he comes out on the war stage and says, I am now convinced, meaning that I am now 110% sure that Putin is set to invade Ukraine. It simply means that there is nothing that can stop the invasion. When he made that statement, he then said to the Ukrainian president, he said, do not attend the Munich security meeting that is taking place now in Munich, Germany. But guess what happened? The guy angrily went and attended the summit. And I'm going to tell you something that the guy said at the summit that will help you understand why I said that Ukraine is only being used as a pawn, as a bargaining chip. For instance, the Ukrainian president went to that summit and he said, you cannot live in a country where people from all over the place are telling you that war is coming tomorrow, war is coming the next day, war is coming. And capital flight is happening in the country. So many things are happening. Economy is crumbling. And you want us to keep quiet. And on top of that, you're telling us not to attend a summit. Are you kidding me? Like, you want me to sit back in Ukraine while you guys decide the destiny of my nation? In a different interview, he was actually saying this. He said, how can they be deciding and discussing about us and then I'll be sitting back in Ukraine? For what? And he angrily went and attended the summit. The Ukrainian leader made the trip here despite warnings from the US administration that it might be unwise to travel given the threat against his country. Later, on stage, he was asked about President Biden's assertion that President Putin has decided to invade in the next few days. We stand ready to respond to everything. We cannot remain passive. How can you live in a state where you are told on a daily basis that war will happen, that tomorrow the advance will happen? It means crushing national currency, money being taken out, businesses closing. Can you live in that kind of country? Can you have stability in that kind of country? No. The guy is agitated. He's angry. He's wondering, why? You guys are saying war is coming, war is coming. And we're not seeing anything. And we actually want peace, but you keep saying war, war, war. And you're still telling me not to be a part of the discussion of this whole thing. And on top of that, you guys claiming that you're going to impose sanctions on Russia if Russia invades. And he's saying, why do you have to wait for Russia to invade our country before you impose sanctions on Russia? If you allow Russia to invade before you impose sanctions, then we wouldn't have any country. Well, our country would have been decimated. So of what use would the sanction be then? And that's the point he was making. And he even went to the point of saying that if care is not taken, he might even revisit the Budapest Agreement. Remember, the Budapest Agreement, the Budapest deal was a very dangerous dimension to the whole thing. That was a deal that banned Ukraine from ever developing or possessing nuclear capabilities. Because that was the only reason, the only grounds on which Russia was able to allow Ukraine to go. Remember, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Ukraine was a part of that Soviet Union. Poland, Estonia, all these other ones. There were agreements that were reached and signed. And those agreements were the basis on which you, uh, Russia, Kremlin, was able to allow them to go and be on their own and then choose whoever they want to join. Which is why the other guys were able to join NATO, right? If they were still part of that Soviet Union, none of them would have joined NATO. Now, part of the deal that allowed Russia to give Ukraine the freedom to go and step away and decide their own destiny was that Budapest Agreement that says they cannot possess nuclear capabilities they cannot have this, this level of weapon. They cannot have this. They cannot have that. Just so that they cannot become a potential threat to Russia, to the homeland of the Soviet Republic. 
That was what happened. And the guy actually said on world stage, which is the Ukrainian president, that if he not taken, he might have to revisit that, meaning that he might have to actually rescind the promise not to develop nuclear weapons. So they may even begin to, because now they feel like they are just like a pawn being used by everybody else, that they need to have a say. Because in this world, if you don't have nuclear capabilities, you don't have a say. Plain and simple. Take it to the bank and cash it. The only reason many people will sit at the table and talk with you is because you have nuclear capabilities. That's why they won't let countries in Africa have nuclear capabilities. Ukraine used to have the third largest number of nuclear weapons in the world. But it's all disbanded because that was the condition that was given by Russia to be able to let them go. The condition that was given to Eastern Germany to join uh, Western Germany was that NATO would not expand eastward, which I've explained to you in a previous video. They gave conditions for certain things that they did. But today what we are seeing is that NATO, from the last video that I published, has now expanded militarily into Eastern Europe. The Secretary General of NATO announced this the last time. And today you have Boris Johnson telling you that they have also increased their presence in Estonia militarily. They've increased their presence in Poland. And these are next door neighbors to Russia. And Russia is a superpower. So if that is not the height of provocation, tell me what is. In case you don't believe me, let me play you what Boris Johnson said recently. I think it was yesterday or the day before yesterday. Already the UK and our allies are strengthening the defences of the eastern flank of NATO. We're increasing the British contribution to exercise cold response by sending our newest aircraft carrier, HMS Prince of Wales, and three commando brigade. We're doubling our presence in Estonia to nearly 2,000 troops. We've increased our presence in Poland to 600 troops by sending 350 Marines from 4-5 commando. We've increased our presence in the skies over southeastern Europe with another six typhoons based in Cyprus. We're sending warships to the eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And I've placed another 1,000 troops on standby to respond to any humanitarian emergency which we all fear is increasingly likely. This is UK. And if you listen further, you will hear where he said that the US is also doing the same thing and all the NATO allies are doing the same thing they are they are they are boosting their troop levels around russia in the eastern flank of europe something that has never happened before and this is why russia is becoming agitated this is why even the military drill that russia was doing with belarus or belarus has now been extended it's no longer going to terminate at the time they wanted it to terminate. They're now going to extend it because Russia now says like the increasing insecurity is becoming alarming. And so they have to prepare for eventualities. This is what is happening right now, people of God. These guys are desperate for war. And you see, I am not pro-Russian. I don't have anything on Putin. I don't care about these people. They all are part of this whole game. But what I'm trying to help us understand is the game that they are playing with our destinies. Why is it that every time I see the Western powers, NATO, America, and the rest of them talking, I don't feel any genuine sense of okay, I want to de-escalate. I don't see them genuinely wishing for any form of de-escalation okay what i see is the eagerness to really make the war happen even if the war was potentially not meant to be we want it to happen we desperately need this war because let's assume that russia has done all the things that they say russia has done why is there no real effort on that side for now, as of yesterday, Russian President Vladimir Putin was on a phone call two times, two different phone calls with Emmanuel Macron of France. And that was just to look for more avenues for diplomatic efforts. The guy is genuinely trying to show that, look, I really don't want this war. 
But I hate the fact that you guys are trying to make Ukraine join NATO despite the agreement that we secured from you guys in the 1990s that you will not expand eastward. You've already taken more than 10 of our former Soviet nations and now you want to take Ukraine, which is just very, very close to us. So Ukraine is, is like a very big part and parcel of Russia. And that's not to say that Ukraine doesn't have the right to be independent. But the point is that Russia has the right to feel the angst that they feel right now. But the West doesn't think so. And so you see them rushing to war, which is why I did the breakdown that I did the last time when I was telling you that one of the major reasons why this war has to happen is not just only because of COVID, which was brought about to introduce the Great Reset. And the Great Reset is another way of saying the New World Order. If you look at Klaus Schwab, he wrote a book about COVID-19, the Great Reset. So COVID-19 is basically the thing that brought about the Great Reset. But the consummation of the Great Reset cannot happen until there is a global war. Because every time that our world has gone through a world war, the order that existed before the war never carried on after the war. You change to a new order the moment a world war happens. And the Great Reset brought about by COVID-19 has already prepared the ground. What is left now is for the war to happen so that the new order will come, which is what you call the new world order. That's what this whole thing is all about. I don't ever want you to miss a thing about this. You can see the protests going on all over the place. You see what is happening in Canada. Pleasantly surprised by Canadians. I never thought they had those kind of balls to be able to challenge tyranny as they are doing today. Trudeau invoked emergency act. In other words, he declared martial law on peaceful protesters. And after declaring it, he thought that everybody would just, you know, sheepishly run home and stay away from trouble. But you see what is happening in Ottawa today. More people are pouring into the street, resisting tyranny. It's happening in New Zealand. It's happening in Australia. It's happening in different parts of Europe and different parts of the world. In America, even when Trudeau was saying that the guys are not allowing goods to flow from U.S. to, to Canada, and that was part of the reason why he did what he did. Guess what? American truckers on their own has now gone to block that same opening that he was expecting for things to come through from America. They blocked their own side of the border to show him that, look, even if you stop them from blocking, we're going to block it on our own. So people are angry about the vaccine mandate and they want it to collapse because it's like a chain that chains you and doesn't allow you to breathe or to move at all. And these guys know that this is happening. If the world doesn't happen immediately, everything that COVID has gotten for them will collapse. All the, all the, all the tyrannical laws that they have already initiated on account of COVID, all of it will all be fizzled away. And they don't want that to happen. That's why they are feverishly pursuing this war. And it's supposed to be a global war. But let me tell you something. Do you know that it is possible that God could bring them out on the street like this and shame all of them by destroying all their plans and giving us another chance. Do you know that's possible? It is extremely possible and very, very likely. I don't know. I can't tell I'm not God. But if that is what God wants to do, I think we need to continue to pray that God would disgrace these people. That even if there's any war that will happen, it will be amongst they themselves, the, the elite who want to destroy the rest of us. Let them destroy themselves. Because what they want to do is to start the war and run into their caves and let the rest of the innocent people die. That's what it is. They want to punish you for resisting the COVID tyranny. That's what the war is going to do. And more diseases will come out. Bill Gates, you know, even admitted recently that there's going to be another pandemic. They know, they, they tell you what they want to do. And they're not hiding it. But we have a God up there in heaven. That even if he doesn't change his mind to stop this madness, that when they see the blood on the doorposts of our homes and those of our loved ones, that this calamity will pass over us. That's my prayer for you and your loved ones. And may God bless you.